What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Johnny Mac here. Just wanted to give you a heads up that if you are looking for a community that is open to discussion as far as mentorship, conservation, the wild, becoming a better person, and all of that, there is a group for you on Facebook, and it is called Soul Seekers. Soul Seekers, we are all about making ourselves a better person. We're all about making sure hunting lasts for generations to come and encouraging people to get plugged in. Whether you are someone who has something to give or someone who needs to soak it up like a sponge, this is a community for you and I encourage you, I strongly encourage you that if you're on Facebook to join Soul Seekers and if you're not on Facebook, hop on there just for that group. It is only gonna be as powerful as we all make it. And so just remember that life happens for you, it doesn't happen to you, and that you can't outgive good. You can't outgive good, people. I want you to understand that, and I want you to believe it, because when we believe that and we lead with courage and we lead with intention, lives are changed, lives are transformed, just like on this podcast, Transformation Through Primal Adventure. Be blessed. Enjoy this episode. Talk soon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship is conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters, both new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. The Soulful Hunter podcast is also proudly presented by the Crazy Elk Company. Based out of the state of Washington with products made in America, they are providing solutions with gear to problems you didn't even know you had. Their tag wall is one of those solutions, and I had the pleasure of using it on all of my hunts this last year, and it is now a mainstay in my kill kit. The tag wall is a water-resistant zippered pouch that comes with its own reusable zip ties to safely and securely store your notch tag for quick and easy access. For more information, go to crazyelkcompany.com and use the code SOULFUL with a capital S to save 20% at checkout. Be blessed, everyone, and as always, stay soulful. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack, and today I got a wonderful guest and someone who you might recognize from YouTube. And when I was in my journey of learning how to hunt, and I was searching every sort of Washington state hunt, whether it was bears, deer, elk, whatever, there kept being a familiar face that would pop up on YouTube, and that is Samong Yang from Samong Outdoors on YouTube, and you might know him as Sai Outside on Instagram, and he's my guest, and we're going to talk all about his story, his journey, and everything that goes with it. So Sai, thank you so much. Samong, thank you so much for uh, joining us for an episode. Dude, Johnny, I really appreciate this opportunity, man. Super stoked to be on here. <laughs> it's always a good time here at the Soulful Hunter. We never let you down. Brother, you <laughs> had a, an amazing 2021 so far. It seems like it, every time you go afield, something's dying, and that's quite an accomplishment. So let's uh, before we even get into that, where where did you learn to hunt? Where uh, were you raised a hunter? Was this something that? And how old are you? Give a little background to the listeners who who you are and how you how you got started. Yeah, so for me, I grew up hunting. Um, I I don't even remember the age I grew up hunting because I I was just always into it because my parents, not necessarily my mom, but my dad, he was huge into hunting, and not just my dad, but basically my entire family, my uncles and all of my older cousins, like hunting was just always part of life. Like I don't know life without hunting pretty much. And I think it goes much further than that. It goes back to culture and back where my parents came from, because back in Laos, which is the country they're from, it's a very poor country. And in order to survive, you either had to raise animals like farm animals or for the vast majority of people there, you had to hunt to eat meat. And so hunting has always just been the roots of our culture, which is just Hmong. And so when my parents 
and my uncles, they fled over to America for, as refugees from the Vietnam War. You know, they just carried over the hunting and fishing mentality. Like it just never left them. And so they came over in the late 80s and I was born in the late 90s. And like I pretty much just grew into the heart of hunting here in Washington because that's where they found refuge in the States. And so that's literally how I got started. It's not like I didn't find it later in life. Like I just was always exposed to hunting ever since I was born. You know, like when I was a little infant, my dad would come home with like a deer head or something that he killed. And so I just naturally took hunting. And that's basically what has led me to where I am today. Man, that is, uh, that's pretty awesome. So you, what what was the first hunt that you remember? I think the first ever hunt, and I could be wrong, but the first hunt, the earliest hunt I can recall is a grouse hunt up in North Central Washington. It was me, my dad, and my two older brothers. I, if I had to guess, I was probably like three years old or four years old. And my dad was like, we need to get to the top of this mountain because there's a lot of grouse on top of this mountain. And I remember just hiking up this old four-wheeler road and I was just bawling my eyes out. Like (laughs) I was just crying. I was like, why are we going to the top of this mountain? Like my legs are burning. Like we're not seeing anything. Like I was crying so bad. My dad was like, dude, you need to, you need to stop crying, man. You're going to scare all the animals away. But at that time, I mean, I was like three years old, four years old. Like I didn't know hunting. I was just like, why are we climbing this mountain? And sure enough, we eventually make it to the top of the mountains miraculously. And we get up there and sure enough, like grouse are just everywhere. And so my dad, uh, he shoots, I think back then it was a limit of three. He shoots his three grouse. And then my older cut or my older brother, he also shoots his three limits of grouse. And that was like my first time, like actually like seeing somebody shoot an animal and like actually getting to go and see the animal while it was still fresh and dead because prior to that like i've just seen like you know like a deer head that my dad would bring home so it's like you never see the full animal and so that's like my earliest memory of hunting man i tell you that is a pretty cool story what was your emotion from it were you just like oh sweet or were you like ooh, this is uh i'm not sure how i feel about this what what was your take on it Dude, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, <laughs> the, the only, the only, the only reason why I was crying was because like I was just my legs were just burning. Like I was just, you know, you you climb up a mountain, it's tiring, and as a little three, four year old, like you don't know any better. So to compensate for your pain, you cry. But when we got to the top of the mountains and we're not climbing the mountains anymore, every time my dad shot a grouse, like my dad would tell me to go fetch the grouse because he would shoot out of a tree, the grouse would fall down. And he'd be like, you need to go find this grouse. And so <laughs> it, it was like a game. It was like a game, right? Like that's how you play with little kids, right? You, you make it a game so that they enjoy it. And so my dad would send me out and I would have to go find the grouse. And when I find it, I when I found my first grouse, like I was so happy. Like I was screaming for my dad. And my dad was like, yeah, like good job. Obviously, like just trying to make me feel proud. But I mean, the, the grouse was like 15 yards away. So it wasn't like it was that hard. But as a little kid, like I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Dude, so you got your start into hunting as a bird dog. Great job, man. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but now that you say that, yes, I was a bird dog. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. That is so cool. So, okay, how old are you now? I am 24 right now. Dude, you are just a young buck making a name for yourself out in the hunting world. How, uh, it seems like when I watch your YouTube channel, you know, it, it's a, always a family affair. You do a lot of stuff solo and it's pretty impressive to see. But at the same time, it sounds like it's always like an uncle or a cousin or <laughs> your dad or something like that. Is is that kind of how you guys always go about your hunts? Or at what point did you branch out into being like, all right, this is what I want to do? Yeah. So like I said, like when my family moved over, basically as refugees, like it's always a family thing, right? So uh, my my dad, he's very close with my uncles. Like, they're essentially best friends. And so whenever somebody's like, hey, I want to go hunting, he's like, he invites everybody, right? So it's like, hey, I'm going to go deer hunting. You should come with me. And so we always just hunted as family. And, like, that's really what we're still doing today. And, you know, it's it's just weird to think, you know, because I get a lot of questions from people asking. It's like, hey, like, I'm – completely by myself i don't know anybody who can hunt like do you have any tips for me and it's like it always like hits me different because i'm like wow like i never known 
hunting outside of family. Like I can't even imagine having to go hunting and having nobody to go hunting with. Like I, <laughs> it feels very daunting. You know, it's like it's like I just don't know family outside of family hunting. To be honest, hearing it's you, just always been the family thing. Yeah, hearing you say that, it, it it makes me feel like okay, someone understands it because as an adult, when I got into hunting at thirty. Uh, 30 years old, 31 years old. It wasn't until what, 33 that I shot my first, uh, big game animal. You know, that was like, what is that? It was only four years ago. And, and here I am like trying to learn how to hunt and nobody knows, no one knows how to hunt. No one's talking to me about it. And so I was like, well, shoot, I don't really necessarily feel comfortable going out in the woods by myself learning and doing this. And that was my own uh, courage issue. It's something that I had to get over as an adult. At the same time, I recruited my buddy and, and uh, now partner, Tony, at Two Shot Tony, to I called him up one day. I was like, hey, man, you want to start hunting with me? He was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> I sent him a link through a text message to uh, to Hunter Safety and then that was literally my hunting community. And so part of that journey was, I was like, well, shoot, how am I going to make friends in the hunting world? Uh, and, and so I started doing community events to get people involved so that I could network. And it's just led into what it is today. And it's so cool. Here you are. When Do you feel like you are ever going to branch out of the family tree and really, or is it always going to be like, hey, dad, uncle, all this stuff, like, are we all putting in for tags together and, and doing that route? Or is uh, Simon going to start branching out on his own at any time? Yeah, so it's it's funny that you, you say that because that's literally what I, I did this year. Like this year, I, mean, I guess it would be last year when I was planning my hunts for this year, I was like, you know, like, I love my family, but like, how about I try to branch out, whether it's I go on my own or I just go with new friends and new people and so i will always have hunts specifically planned for my family like that's something that i will never stray away from but at the same time it's like i'm very fortunate that i get a hunt as much as i can because as of right now like youtube's all i do so i have all the time in the world to hunt and a lot of my family you know they're they work a full-time job and so a lot of times they're only free weekends and so i'm like okay i have all these weekdays off like how can i plan certain hunts with new people that I've never hunted with or new friends or something like that. So this year is actually my first year where I've really like gone outside of my family and just started hunting with different people. Yeah. Were you the one that was reaching out to other people to uh, get connected or were they, did you have people knocking at your door saying, Hey, we want to get connected with you? Um, for the most part, it's just people asking me. Um, I don't know why people want to hunt with me, but you know, like people will say like, Hey, like, are you ever down to hunt? And the, the, the truth is like, I would love to just hunt with all my followers. Like I, I really can't thank my followers enough for like, you know, their time that they spend watching my videos. But the, the reality is, is like you, it's just impossible to hunt with thousands of people. It, it just, it's impossible. <laughs> right. Right. And so it's like, it's like, you have to like slowly chip away one person at a time. But at the same time, it's like, I also want to not just hunt with anybody. I want to also hunt with people where I think they have some type of mentality or whether they're just a beginner hunter and they're just like, Hey, I literally don't know what I'm doing. Like, are you willing to just help me, you know, put, get me on the right path. And so sometimes it, it really just varies. Um, it really just depends on how I feel about that person. And it's not to be anything personal against other people. It's just a matter of like, is this right? Is this the right time to go hunting with this person? Totally. You got to vibe with the people, man. You know, uh, exactly. if you're out in the woods and all you listeners, if you've ever experienced this, I'm sure you know exactly what we're talking about. When you're in the woods hunting with the wrong person, it really sucks. And especially <laughs> if now, Sai, you might not experience this because all you do is hunt and uh, all you do is YouTube. But as a, as a father of three boys, and a full-time school teacher, my t time hunting, even when I'm mentoring people, is still my time hunting. And any time that I'm a weekend warrior and I can get out, but it's not the best experience with anyone who's not truly enjoyable, it's like, oh, that really, that really stinks. Yeah. So I highly encourage all you listeners to, when you mentor people and before you mentor people, build a relationship. 
Build the relationship. Uh, mentorship is not just taking someone out of field. A lot of it is, you know, communication, uh, working through scouting and all that different stuff. And so, I, Samong, have you had any bad experiences with being out in the field with anyone? Surprisingly, no. Like, everybody I've uh, gone with, like, it's been amazing, uh, truthfully. Like, um, I think this year, outside of my family, I've gone out with about six brand new people that I've never hunted with before. And all of them have been spectacular. Like, I, I don't regret, and I would hunt with those people any day again. Ah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so let's, uh, let's dive into this YouTube channel of yours. So, mm-hmm. in, in the state of Washington... You know, you get you get people that well. First off, that inspired me to get my community going. Is um, you know, learning that you can just put yourself out there it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there and be like, okay, this is what I do. And you are somebody who has really excelled. What when? At what age were you when you started your YouTube channel? Ah, uh, so I started a lot of different channels. Right, uh, I think the first ever channel I started was like in 2011 when I first got an iPod touch for Christmas as a Christmas present. And that was back when I was just uploading random videos. Like it, it wasn't even hunting related. I would just go out, just film whatever, just upload on my channel. And I just thought it was the coolest thing to be able to record something and just to be able to play back the video and just watch it. And so I think over time, you know, I was just like, well, I go hunting a lot. Like, why don't I just start like you know randomly putting these hunting clips that i record on youtube and so i think 2012 that season i just started posting these crappy ipod quality videos online they never took off obviously they got like 10 views and i was so jacked about it <laughs> and you know like over time you know it, it just became a thing that i really enjoyed i'm just like dude like what if instead of eclipse what if i can make a, a movie for the family right and so I would take all my clips, I would compile it at the end of the season, and I would upload it to the family. So at first, it was just a family thing. It wasn't even about trying to, you know, build this YouTube channel. And my family is like, dude, like, it's kind of hard to, you know, always pass out DVDs. Why don't you just start uploading it to YouTube so that we can watch it whenever we want to? So I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. So I start uploading these crappy videos online. (laughs) And for some reason, like, people are like slowly trickling in like random people are like trickling in. They're like, dude, like it's so cool to watch Washington hunting videos. And back then, like I didn't know how lacking of Washington was in the hunting video on YouTube, right? Like nobody's doing this back then. And over time it got to a point where I was just like, dude, I just want to keep making videos because I genuinely enjoyed it. I really enjoyed putting the videos together and just watching how my hunt unfolded that particular weekend or week. And over time, it just slowly progressed. And I think 2016 was I was when I said, I'm going to dedicate a di- brand new channel specifically showcasing Washington hunting and fishing. And so that's where Samong Outdoors was created. And back then, like, again, it was still small. It never took off. But again, over year, over the years, it just slowly kept growing. And fast forward five years later, it's basically where it's at. Man, that's something else. And now... I remember this is, this had to have been about 10 years ago. I remember I had a student in my class and he was a, a kid who sweetheart of a person but just not motivated for anything. And I remember being like, "Dude, what? You going to care about your education? You going to care about your schooling?" I was like, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" And he was like, "I want to be a YouTuber." And I was like, a "What?" He's like, yeah, I want to be a YouTuber. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, that's what you want your job to be? You want that to be your career? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, okay, even if that works out, you still have to make sure you pass school and, and graduate and all that stuff. And so it's ironic that here I am in the YouTube game and here you are just blowing up YouTube. Is it something that uh, like kind of just fell into itself? I mean, I know you already gave a little backlog on on sharing your hunts with your family and all that, but at what point were you like, okay, I want to do this. I want to really pursue and uh, see what I can do with this. Yeah, so if somebody told me I would have been doing this as a like essentially a full-time job around this time, I would have called them crazy. I, I never I never in my life would have thought it would have got to the point it, it is right now. 
so around college, so I went to college, I started college in 2015, the fall of 2015. And that's about when my channel, I, I guess not 2015, but 2016, that's about when my channel started picking up a little. Like it wasn't big, but I think I was like at a thousand subscribers. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. I was like, holy crap, like my channel went from like 50 subscribers to a thousand subscribers. And then throughout college, you know, like some people, they know exactly what they want to do in college. I was not one of those people. I was struggling to find what I wanted to do in college. And so, you know, over the years, uh, my first two years of schooling, I was just taking my general requirements. And so, like, I didn't really have a direction picked out. But at the same time, I was still doing YouTube. And so I got into my junior year of college. And at that point, my channel was exponentially growing at this point. And so I'm like constantly looking at my degree and YouTube and I'm like, hmm, how can I make these two work together rather than having YouTube be its own thing and my college degree being its own thing? And so my junior year, I was going to go into computer science, absolutely hated it. And so after one full year of computer science, I said, I'm going to switch majors. I'm going to go into what's going to help build my YouTube brand. And so I switched over to business marketing. And as I'm learning all these things about how to grow your business, I'm, I'm directly implementing what I'm learning in school into my YouTube channel. And when I did that, like my channel started growing. And so by the time I graduated college, I was basically at a platform. I had the platform basically at a point where it was a pretty stable spot and it had the potential basically right in front of its face. And so as soon as I got to college, I said, I told my dad, I was like, give me like one or two years to do YouTube. And let's just see where it takes me. So this is my first year out of college. And so I'm just seeing where it's taking me now. And just double checking, you got your degree, correct? I did get my degree, yes. All in right. business marketing. All right. Awesome. Yeah. How much of uh, the stuff do you feel like you actually could have taught the class? <laughs> All of it, to be honest. <laughs> as a as a teacher, I you know, edu public education is always like go to college, go to college, go to college. I'm like, no way. Go get a trade. Go learn a skill that you can actually apply to your life because so many people just waste money in college. Um, you know, this luckily worked out in your favor for you, but at the same time, man, I'm sure that was a little stressful with being like, I'm paying this much money and I'm not getting much out of it. Oh, absolutely. Like, nothing was, when my channel was still growing and I was still in college, like, dude, like, there was no direction in my life. Like literally I, my YouTube channel wasn't as big as it was now. So like, I couldn't just say, I'm going to go do YouTube because that's a big risk. And a lot of times it fails. And so I was like, I can't just rely on YouTube. I have to also make sure that if that fails, I have a reliable degree to get myself a job. But I, I don't know, I guess one in a million, the stars aligned for me and <laughs> it just worked out in a way. I love it. Well, you know, you talk about your your family uh, being refugees from Laos. I mean, it, not that it makes anything different about ethnicity, but you don't see a lot of a lot of uh, ethnic people in the hunting world, and then especially making it large like what you're doing. So I think you're really providing yourself with a niche and and really hitting a home run with that, my man. Do you get a lot of feedback in that regard? Yeah. So. Again, when I did my YouTube, like I didn't even think of all these stuff. Like it was just really, I just wanted to put videos out there. But then <laughs> I guess naturally it would make sense, right? Like, you know, uh, I'm Hmong. So naturally, like a lot of my audience are from like the Asian background, right? So even today, like a vast majority of my viewers are Asian. And I didn't even know that was a thing. But the more I learn about YouTube and my platform, it's like, yeah, it's really a thing where, you know, I'm showing people like hey yeah it's it's really anybody that can hunt not just a certain ethnic group or you know a race yeah that is i mean at the end of the day man we're just people everyone's just people yeah you know we come from uh different backgrounds and cultures but we all want to be loved we all need food water and shelter you know we love community and there's no difference where you come from or what you look like in that regard. And I think that is something that is often forgotten. And especially with how divisive this world is, it's so important to make sure that we return back to the root of humanity. You know, hue, and when, when someone says hue, man, hue is just colors, right? It's the colors that make up what we are. And that's what makes this world so beautiful. So 
I love it. That's super special. Um, one of the questions I have is you go out and, and you hunt with your family a lot, and you guys have been very successful in dropping a lot of different animals. Do you guys end up buying much meat from the grocery store, or do you mostly sustis, uh, what, subsistent hunt in fish? Yeah, so um, I think it's it's pretty mis leading right like you you go on my instagram page and it seems like i'm having a killer of a year which i am i'm not taking anything away from it i'm very i'm having a very lucky year this year but how my family has always done it is whoever kills an animal it's not just that person that gets the meat we divide that animal evenly per household right so like the other day when my dad shot his bull it didn't go directly to my family we divided it evenly to how many uh, households were involved with that particular harvest and so when my dad shot his bull, there was four different households. So we split the meat of that bull to four different households. So when you think about it, we got a quarter off of like a quarter meat of that bull in our freezer. So when you think about that and you're dividing all these deer and elk, my specific household, it's not all that much meat, right? And mm -hmm. my house, we have like six people in the household. So you blow through meat quite a bit. But instead of just necessarily relying on the supermarket, what we actually go do is we will actually go out to local farmers and butcher an animal ourselves because it's just more cost effective that way. And a lot of times those locally raised animals are in a much more humane setting than supermarket meat. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I I had the the blessing of taking an elk a deer and two bear this last year and i am in the same regard where it sounds like i should have a ton of meat in my freezer but anytime i'm with my hunting partner tony or anyone's packing out that animal they are getting a share of it and it ends up being a family of five um and i'm like dude it's one year removed and I feel like I'm already in a meat crisis. <laughs> you know, it, it, go, it goes so fast, but we also this year uh, ended up buying half a cow from a local uh, farmer. And, and that is one of the ways that this first time, ironically, that we've been, ha we've had to buy red meat in a few years and that's been a blessing, but man, it's uh it's been a cold, cold year for, for the, soulful hunter in washington backcountry <laughs> we uh got on some bears in august had uh, two shot shot and missed and then we got on a beautiful roosevelt four by four bull shot and missed and then on our mule deer hunt just a couple of weeks ago we saw a ton of deer and not a single like true three point everything was forks with questionable points on it and i was like it's a real a real bummer but uh it happens. That's that, why they call it hunting and not sounds, killing. That sounds exactly like hunting in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, Samong, do you bow hunt at all? I, I see everything, you know, most of the time you're always carrying a rifle. You ever thought about archery hunting? So I have archery hunted before. Um, the only reason why I don't do it as much as I like is because I don't have my own bow yet. I've been just borrowing my, my older brother's bow. And when you borrow, it's like, it's cool that you have a bow, but when it comes to archery, man, bows are so specific. Like it's so person specific that I don't want to like torque the bow and make it fit me when I have to give it back to my brother. And so the only reason why I haven't been archery hunting as much as I'd like to is just because I haven't, I don't have a bow. And that's actually on one of my things to buy for next year, because I definitely want to get into the archery you know, world more. Yeah, dude, it's so much fun. It's addicting. And it opens up so many more opportunities. I'm sitting on uh, a second deer tag for Whidbey Island here in the state of Washington. And it's uh, a doe tag that opens up August 1st and goes all the way to December 31st. And it, it has no weapon requirement other than whatever the the land use of, of whatever they prefer. And so... Mm having that in my arsenal of being like, okay, go to a landowner and be like, Hey, would you let me uh, shoot any deer? Um, what weapon? Well, whatever you would prefer, muzzle loader, rifle, uh, bow. It just is so much nicer to have that. Even if you're not fully always going to do every hunt with the archery, but it's awesome. With a YouTube channel like yours, man, I'm surprised that uh, you're not getting on that a lot quicker and, and, and capitalizing on on the ability to to work with some different companies and get their brands in front of eyes because let's face it social media and youtube nowadays has just become a giant advertising platform 
And yeah. do you do you end up getting that a lot? I mean, I had a company reach out to me the other day on social media on Instagram, and they're like, "Hey, we'll give you fifty percent off uh, truck custom wheels. Um, just you know, advertise, throw out a couple pictures." And I was like, "Dude, I'm not going to pay you to advertise for you," and that <laughs> that, that didn't <laughs> really sit that well with me. But do you get a lot of that? Oh, absolutely. I I mean. I think anybody that has any type of platform on social media gets those from time to time. Some more than others. Uh, I definitely get those a lot. But the the thing when it comes to sponsorships is I'm pretty strict on what I allow as a sponsor or a sponsor of a certain video. I don't just, you know, take any sponsor I get. Like I like to uh, build a relationship with my sponsors. That's why a lot of people ask me, it's like, why do you only have two sponsors? And it's just because like, like I like to thoroughly test gear before I say, hey, I want to be sponsored by a certain sponsor. Not only that, it's like I also need to know the people behind the company. It's not just, hey, I, I want to get free products, so I'm just going to say yes to you. It's like I really take my sponsors very seriously because I genuinely prefer a much more authentic relationship than just somebody in it for free products and promotions. Uh, so that's the only reason why I haven't been on that like sponsor train as much as some people would like me to. But maybe next year, you know, slowly, I'm always looking for opportunities for both my channel and companies, but it's a much more strict type of procedure. That's just how I operate. I love it. It's, it's very wise. You know, it, by the way, w at what point are you going to need some Damascus steel knives in your collection? You've been getting hit up on that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I get hit up with that a lot. <laughs> But hey, I, I think don't know. I, I think you need some Damascus knives in your collection. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I always like to forward them on to other people. Hey, you need to check out. I'm gonna everyone I get now in my DMs. I'm gonna be like, yeah, ask Samong. I know he's been looking into those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so now I know where they've been coming from. Oh Appreciate man, it. that's funny. I love it. Uh, okay, so Samong, what uh, what was this year like? I mean, you. Your, your Instagram's packed with a bunch of animals right now, which is always fun to see. And I think in the hunting world, at the same, like there's this fine line of walking social media because, you know, we hunt for the animals. And at the same time, it, it, it I, I guess it's hard for me to put this into words. It feels like followings don't even happen unless you start dropping animals. So, uh, what what has that been like for you, and and has have you seen just major growth in your socials specifically because you've been a part of some uh, epic opportunities? Oh, absolutely. Um, like my sponsors, my two sponsors, like dude, they open up a lot of opportunities for me. Like the the gear they provide, and in certain ways, like the compensation they provide, like it allows me to do things I could do, like go on hunts that I would not be normally be able to do on my own. And so when you just have more opportunities to go and film hunts and be successful on a specific hunt, like you said, like you drop an animal, your, your platforms grow. And so this year I've just been able to be on so many hunts. And so, yeah, this year, like I've seen a direct result of those hunts. And the thing with my YouTube channel is I'm so behind on editing videos because I've been so busy hunting. But just the videos that I have been upload, been able to upload this season, it's already boosted my channel like way crazy so i can't i can't even imagine what the rest of the videos this season are gonna do <laughs> i love it okay so what advice do you have for anyone who's listening to this podcast and thinking about filming their hunts and thinking about starting a youtube channel maybe it's not even filming their hunts maybe it's just talking about their gear maybe you know everybody loves a good pack dump video everyone loves good gear review videos you got these different things that happen and youtube is such a resource nowadays what pieces of advice can you give from someone who has taken marketing classes and has, um, you know, grown your platform as large as it has become? What What are some some tips that you have for people? Yeah, so th those are actually some really great questions. But the the biggest one that I've noticed that is has the biggest impact on your growth is consistency you have to be consistent at uploading videos. And the problem with hunting is you can't, at, at least the average person can't hunt year round. You hunt in the fall, but then once you hit winter, 
spring and summer, you have all these months where you're not hunting and you don't have content, right? So you have to be creative and find videos to fill in those gaps outside of hunting season. So for me, I also fish, right? So I fill in like the summer months and the spring months and some of the winter months after season and before season by just fishing and just making fishing videos. Because I've noticed that the more you show your face in front of your your viewers, the more they familiarize themselves with you. And over time, it feels like they build a relationship with this random person online. And I feel like I feel like the more they they know you, the more loyal those people are to you. And what you want on a channel is loyalty because there are people with millions of subscribers, but then their videos are only getting like 5,000 views. So the vast majority of people who who once said, I, I want to follow this person, have basically just forgotten about them, right? And yep. so that's the thing with social media is like you have to constantly be learning that. But then the biggest thing is just consistency. Be consistent on your videos, but at that same time, also know that you don't have to force yourself to upload a video because I, what I do nowadays is I just tell myself, it's like, I want to upload the best videos I can. But at the same time, I don't want to make my viewers wait too long. Granted, it's been three weeks since I uploaded my last video, but that's just because I've been so busy hunting, gathering more footage. I think, right? I think there's always a grace period with the hunting industry or the hunting world where if things don't get uploaded in the fall, it makes sense as to why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's not like I'm just trying to ditch my channel. It's just like I literally just haven't had time to sit down in my computer and edit. Like literally, I just got home like two hours ago from elk camp. And literally just got took a shower, got on here because I had a meeting with you, right? And so tomorrow night, we're headed back up to L camp. So I literally don't have time to edit. <laughs> Man, that is uh, that's that's good advice. Now, when you say consistency for uploading, what what is consistency? So that's a good question because a lot of people think consistency. I guess I should elaborate. So when I say consistency, I don't just mean like uploading one video a week that's part of it but that's not all of it the other thing too is you have to be consistent with the quality of your videos right like if you upload one super high quality video and like a lot of people love that video and they subscribe to your channel because they love that one video and you follow it up with like seven absolutely crappy videos people are going to be like wait like like I'm let down, you know, like I didn't subscribe to watch these seven crappy videos. Like I subscribe to watch that quality video. And so not only do you have to be consistent in terms of how many videos you upload in a certain time period, you also have to be uh, ensuring that these qual the quality of these videos are constant and throughout your videos. If they're not constant, they should only be getting better. Mm, that's interesting perspective. You know, as someone who has my own YouTube channel, for me, what my videos have not always been the best. It was more just content to put out there to support people on their journey. And it wasn't until maybe about a year ago, year and a half ago, where our video content has been phenomenal, but I have not released any of that really high content onto the channel yet because uh, all I actually, I don't know if you are, are aware of this, but I actually launched a, a show on Carbon TV this year called Soul Seekers. And so yep. we, we released all nine episodes on Carbon. And I'm like, man, I really want to drop it on YouTube because I want to show everyone on YouTube, like, this channel's extremely upped its game. But I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm ready to do that. At the same time, my numbers started growing when I started releasing the podcast on video platform on YouTube. So whether we're not necessarily recording this in video, but we'll have a static image. And then just the consistency of that once a week started growing the channel more and more. And, you know, it, you know, it's so interesting, you know, we're having this conversation, but the people listening to this podcast, who knows what they're thinking? Maybe they're like, Oh, okay. I can do this. Okay. You know, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't sound so bad. Maybe they're a parent and their child wants to start one. You know, my kids, my children are seven, uh, no six, five and two, and they love YouTube. And so I'm like, man, should I start a YouTube channel with my kids? And I'm like, wait a minute, I have a YouTube channel. And it's so, dude, this is, so, you grew up in it because you were born in the 90s and this is what you did. For someone who's an adult doing this, it's it's like, whew, 
being a, especially being a public educator, you know, a lot of my students don't even know I have a YouTube channel. A lot of my students don't even know I have a podcast and I don't, I don't necessarily share that with them because, you know, I, at some point it's this professional boundary of I'm a teacher and here's what I'm doing versus I don't want them to necessarily track me down in my personal life. But here you are being your own personality for your channel. So do you ever find that to be any sort of conflict with what you want to do outside of maybe hunting or, or anything like that? You know, I think for me, I'm very lucky that, you know, like hunting and fishing is really what I breathe. And so like outside of that, there's not really anything else I'd rather be doing. And so the fact that my channel aligns with what I'm just so passionate about, like there's really no conflict that I've, come to find honestly like even if i wasn't doing youtube even if i wasn't filming i'd still just be hunting and fishing whenever i can and so luckily for me you know i know a lot of people have different interests but for me it's like man like i really just breed hunting and fishing so that's there's no conflict there that's beautiful so what um what are other advice do you have besides the consistency for uploading what else do you have as far as uh advice for people growing a youtube channel yeah, so outside of, I guess, YouTube itself, it goes into the fundamentals of creating videos, not necessarily a, ch a channel. So it goes down to, like, camera gear and also filming styles, right? So people, I think people overthink this process because people think that you need, like, a $3,000 camera with, like, a $3,000 lens with, like, a super high-quality mic. And a lot of times, it's like, yeah, it, it helps in the overall quality production. But for a lot of people who are just starting, everybody... I'm assuming has like a smartphone and the, the quality of these cameras on our phones nowadays are so good. You can <laughs> pretty much, you can pretty much film everything on a phone and have a decent to high quality hunting video. Like it really can do it. it and that's my biggest thing is like, just use what you have. And over time, when you see certain things where you can improve in the future, then you know, Hey, I need a specific camera that can do this thing that I want to try out. And over time, you're, you're constantly doing this trial and error. And over time, you, you learn what works for you and you learn what doesn't really work for you. And so you eventually build your niche, right? Because that's really all it is about YouTube. You want to build your niche. You want to be unique. And so that's really what I did. I just learned what cameras I work, that work for me. I learned my filming style. I learned I wanted to be more raw versus like, you know, like a film style. And so I just stuck to it. And it, go, it goes back to my point of consistency. All my videos, if you watch them, they're pretty much raw videos. Like there's no fancy editing. There's no fancy filming, you know, stuff like that, like cinematography. And that's what's worked for me. Now, vice versa, somebody who's really passionate about like cinematography, if you stay passionate about that and you stay consistent with that and you learn what camera works for you and how to operate effectively in the mountains, a lot of times that's, what's going to build your foundation that's what's going to build your platform mm. it's good advice and i think that goes back to what i was sharing earlier about my show on carbon tv versus youtube because that is more of a higher cinematography rather than it being like oh, okay well we're just going to make a youtube video and i and there's a clear distinction on consumers on youtube want a certain style rather than consumers on like the outdoor channel or sportsman's network or whatever that is. And there's a certain expectation that is needed to be met um, f from those platforms as well. What do you got yourself a lady friend? You got yourself a girlfriend and, and does, is that going to impact Samong outside when, uh, <laughs> when you do, or if you do, or how's that uh, working out? That, so right now, and I don't, and the only reason why is because I'm really focused on building this platform. I want to make this thing stable um, because like a lot of people like you, you know, you've got a family, you got a full time job. And I'm sure you understand how hard it is to find time to make a video. Like, yes. I'm sure you do, because <laughs> even for me, as somebody as somebody who does it full time, like even right now, like I'm struggling to make a video just because I've been so busy doing other things like going out hunting. And so. Like if I had like other distractions, like it really halts the progress that I want my channel to be growing at, right? And it's not necessarily to say that my channel is more important than certain people, but it's just that as of right now, you know, I haven't found that person. So why would you not just 
strictly focus on building your platform when you have the time to, because there will be a time when you can't do this as hardcore as I like to. <laughs> and so take advantage of the time that you have. That's basically the point. I, I love it. Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie um, Devil Wears Prada? I have not, no. Are you kidding me? A 24-year-old single dude has never seen a movie, <laughs> A Devil Wears Prada? Well, uh, the, to be honest, I don't watch movies. <laughs> I'm, dude, I'm joking with you. I'm totally I'm <laughs> no, messing no, I'm with good. you. I'm the good. point of that, the, there's a quote in that movie that, uh, by the way, I love that movie. My wife and I, we watch it together. Um, it, the, the point of that is there's a quote where it says, um, let me know when your personal life goes to hell. That means you're ready for promotion. And that <laughs> speaks very truly to what you just said, being like, you know, do you want to be a jack of all trades and an ace of none? Or do you want to be really good at what you do and focus on that for the time being until you're ready to transition into something different? And that's a very, uh, very strong and, and sound wisdom that you just dropped for all the listeners right there, because I think that is something that people often forget. They're like, and I also, that's coming from somebody who I believe that you can do it all and you can do it all well. Um, maybe not hunting and all the hobbies, because once I got into hunting, I was like, oh man, no more snowboarding, no more rock climbing, no more mountain biking. Like it's hunting and it's hunting year round because it is more of a lifestyle than it is a hobby or a passion or exactly. a pursuit. And I think that you also is something that it. people forget. Yeah, you do. You hit it on the nail with that. I, I think I think people think that hunting season is hunting. Like that's all you do. But it's like, no, it, it doesn't end. It doesn't ever end. It's literally like a lifestyle that you invest yourself in. And it's just this constant cycle. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Yes. Yes. So my wife, she is a registered nurse. And she is no longer working here in the state of Washington as a nurse because of uh the politics here and King Inslee and his decrees that he makes. He's a jerk. I'm, I'm calling him out right here. And so her and I, she is staying home and homeschooling our children this year because I'm also not a fan of public education. And so, and that's ironic because I'm a school teacher. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but so she's staying home and she is homeschooling our children. And at the same time, she's like, okay, maybe we need to move out of state. And I'll look into getting a nursing job, and then you can homeschool and pursue uh, Washington Backcountry, Soul Seekers, Soulful Hunter podcast, all that stuff. And I was like, you know, that makes sense because right now, doing a full time job, doing a podcast, doing social medias, being what I want to be is a great father and a great husband, it doesn't leave much time for for all the other activities you know um a social media post nowadays especially when you are working on growing a following is a little bit more time intensive rather than just throwing up a picture and being like okay cool <laughs> do you do you find that you do you oh. schedule out your posts or, oh, yeah. or anything like that so on youtube i try to be consistent because that's my main platform instagram is just more of the people who want to stay more up to date because it's just easier to upload a video i mean a, a photo than it is to upload a video right because you you take youtube videos take editing and stuff like that with a photo you could just take a picture throw it up on instagram give it a quick update so my instagram isn't really to build a platform it's really just more to keep my youtube followers up to date because like on youtube I haven't uploaded for three weeks. Some people think I'm dead on YouTube, but the people who follow me on Instagram know exactly what I've been up to, right? So I don't know. It's just how you use a platform, I guess. I love it. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's move into your hunting season this year. What what's been your highlight mm -hmm. so far? That would probably just be yesterday. I mean, don't take me wrong. Like <laughs> I'm having an absolute blessed year in the hunting woods this year. Like. Best season of my entire life, hands down. But man, when my dad killed a bull yesterday, that was probably the highlight. And it just sucks I wasn't there because I literally had to come home the day before to drop off my cousin because he had to go to school. But like I wasn't there, but just to see my dad shoot his first branch bull elk or just to know that he shot it, like that's probably the peak of it. Man, that's some, um, yeah, you know, I think that that's what I, I want to constantly share with people when it comes to the whole mentorship as conservation platform 
and that hunting has the power to transform lives through primal adventure is the fact that you get to a point in your hunting career where shooting the animal, squeezing the trigger is awesome. But the minute that you get to be with somebody and you get to see their joy of them going through that process, it can't be matched. It can't be touched. You know, when when I've mentored somebody, um, for example, I don't know if you got a chance to watch uh, our Badlands film that we put out that we took third place in the Badlands Film Festival this last year, but our mentee, Doug, came on to our spring bear hunt, uh, taught him a lot, got through the process, um, he got to get hands-on with animals, and then that fall, that August, uh, August of 2020, he drew a special island deer permit that opened in August 1st, and he shot his first animal. And just like that, being there for him and seeing that and seeing his reaction is so special to the point where if I could have wild game in my freezer all the time, I don't even have to be the hunter. I just want to be there to support people and see them and see the joy in their lives because it truly is life transforming. And at the age of 24, have you, uh, I mean, you already spoke to it, but do you see this already? Absolutely. I mean, this year I took my little cousin on a spring turkey hunt and he's shot turkeys before, but he's never shot one by calling him in. The moment he he shot that turkey, that turkey dropped, like he was so happy. And it's just been so long since I've seen someone so genuinely happy that they killed it. It was so refreshing. It really just brings back like, you know, like I was once in his shoes. Mm. And to be able to see me basically passing it down, like, dude, that was like the best feeling. <laughs> like one of the best feelings this season. And then fast forward to August, I took out one of my newer friends. His name is Nate. And he went and shot his first bear. I took him. I, I told him. Uh, I was like, if you want to make it hard, let's go scout a brand new spot for two days. We went there, never saw a bear. He was kind of like, man, there's like no bears. I was like, Nate, I got it. I got a spot. If we don't see a bear, something's wrong. <laughs> we go in there for the third day. We hike in 30 minutes. We see a bear. He smokes him. He's just absolutely jacked. Like, he's just so pumped. <laughs> and he, like. Like, he's so pumped. Like, I'm just like, dude, this this is the, like, I feel like I was more excited than he was shooting the bear. I was just so excited to see him that excited, right? And it's just like, like that whole, like, mentor thing. And I know you're all about mentor. Like, it, it truly is a powerful experience, even when you're not the shooter. Yeah. And if we can only get more people to experience that and to understand oh, yeah. that and be and open up their hearts and their eyes to that, then this, then this world is going to change and it is going to transform. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, he said, be the change you want to see in the world. That is, Absolutely. that is what we're doing here. And that is what I, I hear you doing. And Samong, I'm throwing you under the bus right here, calling you out. I went on my very first spring turkey hunt ever this last year. Um, this Well, spring uh -huh. of 2021. Heard birds. Saw him at a distance, never had a single bird come into our calls. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Is it public land? All that. Maybe uh, for 2022, spring of 2022, we might have to connect for a turkey hunt. Dude, you have my number, man. You know what I'm doing, man. <laughs> I'm so down for that. And I think that's the best thing. Like, dude, spring turkey, the reason why I love it so much is because there is just so many turkeys. Like, you've gone out for the first time. You didn't get a shoe one, but did you see how many turkeys there were? I there, heard I heard how many turkeys there were. I've never yeah, really there were like... <laughs> there's so many turkeys. That's why for me it's like I think that's like the best way. And, and don't do for the first year, don't beat yourself up because this is not my first couple years of turkey. I've been doing this for like the past 15 years. And like for like the first 10 years, Dude, we we struggled to kill a turkey. So don't beat yourself up thinking you're doing something wrong because it's a huge learning curve, especially when it comes to turkey. You can watch all the YouTube videos you want and people will make it look really easy. But the thing I always tell people is like a lot of times you're watching people who have been doing it for quite some bit of time. You're hardly ever watching somebody do it for the first time because a lot of times people want to shoot like people want to watch somebody shoot something. So they're going to watch the more experienced hunters. Right. And so people watch my videos now and they're like, what am I doing wrong? And it's just like, dude, like you're, you're not putting yourself at the fair advantage because you're comparing your chapter one to like my chapter 15. 
don't ever do that, right? Like compare your chapter one to my chapter one, and you will see that we have the same exact chapter one. <laughs> that is some wisdom right there. And at the same time, I got to tell you, me sitting still waiting for a turkey, <laughs> it's got to be one of the hardest <laughs> things in the world. Oh, I love oh, it. Oh, no, like, dude, like, I know you have your crew let's plan on a date man like let's let's go kill some turkeys next spring deal done donezo <laughs> it's in the <laughs> bag already all right brother <laughs> how can people find you and support your channel and subscribe to your channel and, and all that so i my main platform is youtube so it's samong outdoors s-a-m-o-n-g outdoors that's my main platform and then my second and only other platform is my instagram which is sy underscore outside Instagram, I update it a little bit more frequent than YouTube because, again, it's easier to upload photos than it is videos. But videos are truly where my heart is at. So if you ever want to go watch some hunting videos in Washington, check it out. Awesome. I'll make sure I have the show notes uh, updated with all the links for you to be able to find Samong Outdoors and his social platforms. Everybody, I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode. This motivated you, inspired you, and gives you some courage and and transformation through Primal Adventure. I'm Johnny Mack. Thank you for listening to this episode. As always, freedom on and stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com and be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful.